And today I'm going to talk about two things. One is I've been asked to talk about how new and emerging technologies is influencing energy efficiency and consumer behaviour. And the second thing I'm going to talk about is um, the role of early adopters, the Alternative Technology Association, my organisation. We're a not-for-profit organisation that's been around for over 35 years. So a lot of our 6,500 members are the early adopters of these new technologies that are coming through. But I'll start off with what's happening with the new technologies that are coming through in households at the moment. And it's a little bit ironic that the actual technologies that we talk to consumers about energy efficiency is actually not energy efficiency, it's battery storage. So at the moment, we don't have people going, oh my God, I went down to Bunnings and saw the most awesome draft sealer, I want 10 of them. We actually go, oh my God, I saw Elon Musk put something out into space, I want a battery storage system. So these are the queries that are coming to us to consumers and when they come up to us for advice, it's then for us to go, well, what are your motivations? What, why do you want this battery storage? Is it that you want to save money? Is it the carbon emission reductions? Is it because you hate your energy retailer and you want to get off the grid? Or is it because you just want the latest gadget that Elon Musk has put out? And what we actually advise people depends on the answer to those questions. And I might go to my first slide. A little way, an example how we do this is last year we worked with Mark Byrne from the Total Environment Centre and developed Australia's first consumer guide on battery storage. And we did this with the New South Wales government. And for us, the easy part of doing, talking about the technology was the nuts and bolts of how battery storage works, the different types of systems, how it gets installed. But the piece that we really wanted to work on was the communications. So why do you want battery storage and what should we be recommending when you do come along? So if you go onto the website, you'll find the whole manual and fact sheets on um, battery storage. But we put together quite a few of these different case studies. And you'll see this as an example where we put together case studies. Someone wanted to do battery storage because they thought it would save their money and their retirement. But all the recommendations we get to them actually are all about energy efficiency. And we say, do the energy efficiency first. If you can do solar, do it now. And let's plan for battery storage in the next few years when those prices start coming down. So that's the sort of approach that we take for all the communications that we do with consumers. I'll talk a little bit about the role of early adopters. Because as I mentioned, most of our members are early adopters of these technologies. And one that we're doing a lot of work with our members at the moment is solar, um, I mean, hot water heat pumps. So hot water heat pumps are a lot more energy efficient. As we know, um, after heating and cooling, hot water is the second use of energy in the home. So we've been experimenting with these new technologies coming through. And with these new um, hot water heat pumps, there has been some testing and trialling that hasn't worked for some of our members. One of is that they wanted to do it for hydronic heating as well as for the domestic heating. In a lot of cases, this doesn't work. They actually, during the, especially in colder days, they're not actually getting enough hot water to do the hydronic heating as well as having domestic hot water. So there's actually got to a point now that a lot of the manufacturers of those heat pumps are not recommending people to use them for hydronic heating and actually will forfeit your warranty. But for us, this is the role that these early adopters play in us. They're testing and trialling these new technologies. So as the prices of them actually come down in the future, we can make recommendations to other consumers of what they should be doing. The other role for early adopters is sharing. So about two years ago, my organisation took over an event called Sustainable House Day. It's an event that happens once a year in September. Last year, we had over 200 homes open across Australia with 29,000 visitors. And the reason that we did this is, well, this is such a great vehicle to do peer-to-peer -peer learning. So it's an opportunity that there's a house open in your street and who, when there's an auction in their street, actually goes to visit the house of their neighbour's going to look. It's using that same concept of going, go and look into these homes, feel them, talk to the homeowners, and we encourage the homeowners to do a warts and all to those visitors of what worked, what didn't, and what they do differently. And this is peer-to-peer -peer learning, not an expert or not a salesperson telling them what to do. And we calculated the impact of this event. We did some work with the CRC for low carbon living. And within two weeks, over 28% of people had already taken action and doing something in their own home. 63% had identified what they're going to do. And 83% did word of mouth to their friends and family what they learned on the day. So I think it's such a good role for the people who have actually done it in their own homes and their communities to start sharing it with other people in their community. 
The third area for early adopters is advocacy. So basically, we learn from what these early adopters have done on what's the regulations and changes we need to do in the system to make it a bit more to a mainstream audience. So one of the issues that we're tackling with in Victoria at the moment is that to get your six-star um, approval for a new building house to apply with the building code, um, under the Australian regulations, you even need a, a solar hot water system or a rainwater tank. So we've actually got people at the moment who are making six or seven star homes, so they're totally confirmed to the code, but they're using a heat pump, they don't, haven't put in rainwater, tank or solar hot water, but they're actually not, they're, they're not getting their certificate to actually say that they can occupy their home because it's not complying. So a little bit of work that we're doing at the moment is to say we should be basing the performance of the house as a priority and we shouldn't be looking at the technology itself. If you've got a heat pump that's actually going to perform better than um, some other technologies, then let's actually say, you know, these heat pumps are performing better and we should be actually making changes to the legislation and true improve the performance and the energy intensities of our homes as well. So... What we've been working at the ATA that, you know, <laughs> we've got the band down the bottom here, um, <laughs> is that we've got homes that, you know, the average bill is about $3,000, but we see that we've a right mix of energy efficiency with like ceiling houses, insulation. Um, they're the things that we should be prioritising for consumers first. Second is about um, retail shifting. Third is solar. And then let's start planning for battery storage into the future. And with this combination, not only do we get less energy intensive homes, we get cheaper bills, but more importantly, we get more comfortable and healthier homes. And we're getting homes that can withstand a changing environment and homes in which people who, are, um, who feel the heat can actually feel like they could put their, on their um, air conditioners on those hot days and they're not actually sacrificing their well-being. So thanks, Laura. Thank you.